Bonjour, je m'appelle Tom Sanders, je suis directeur du département stratégie de perspective et je vous souhaite la bienvenue à ce cycle de séminaires organisé autour du concept de densité urbaine. Ich bin Sie von Harte willkommen auf diese Regs von Seminars, die georganisiert wurden in dem Kader von dem Thema Jahr über städtische Dichtheit. Comme vous le savez peut-être, Perspective est l'opérateur de la région de Bruxelles-Capitale, chargé de définir une stratégie de développement territorial pour Bruxelles. Perspective s'appuie sur le travail d'experts statistiques et d'experts territoriaux pour réaliser des diagnostics précis, mettre en évidence les enjeux urbains et définir les cadres stratégiques et réglementaires du développement de la région. De Perspective situé réside à tous niveaux van stratenblokken tot de grootste delijke op zelfs Europese ruimte. En op alle niveaus zijn de voorwaarden dezelfde. Een diagnose verfijnen, de stedelijke problematieken belichten, een visie bepalen en daarna een strategie uitstippelen om die visie te vertalen in concrete stadsprojecten en het leven van de Brusselaars te veranderen. Door deze weg te volgen, heeft Perspectief het gewestelijk plan voor duurzame ontwikkeling opgesteld dat in 2018 door de Brusselse regering werd goedgekeurd. Het GPDO, zoals we het noemen, is eigenlijk het Brusselse stadsproject. Een mijlpaal en een aaneensluiting van projecten en energieën om vorm te geven aan een duurzame en inclusieve stad. De quelle ville avons-nous besoin demain C'était la question posée au moment de réfléchir sur le projet de ville bruxellois. Et c'est la question qui se pose aujourd'hui, plus que jamais, au moment de mesurer l'impact de la pandémie sur le fonctionnement des centres urbains. Et ce, alors que les enjeux climatiques doivent faire l'objet de réponses structurées, globales, transversales, volontaristes. Dans ce contexte, Le concept de densité fait débat. Quelle forme, quelle intensité, quels équilibres trouver pour garantir la qualité de vie en ville C'est la recherche que nous voulons mener dans le cadre de la mission Projecting Brussels pour poursuivre la dynamique autour du projet de ville bruxellois. Et c'est dans ce cadre que nous aurons le plaisir de nous retrouver tous les mardis pendant six mois avec des experts venant des quatre coins du monde. Je vous souhaite une excellente soirée. Le projet de ville, le plan régional de développement durable, a été approuvé en 2018. Elle constitue la vision de développement de la région sur le moyen et long terme et représente en conséquence le cadre du projet de ville de ce mois. Il tâche de mettre en cohérence un certain nombre de actions initiatives, objectifs ou de projets concrets pour former une trajectoire commune au bout de laquelle Bruxelles doit devenir une ville de proximité durable, moderne et inclusive. Le projet de ville constitue les quatre axes majeurs de travail. Construire une armature territoriale, développer un cadre de vie agréable, durable, attractif, développer une économie urbaine, favoriser le déplacement multimodal durable. Perspective est temps pour suivre la dynamique autour du projet de ville et garantir qu'elle puisse à tout moment faire fonction de cadre général pertinent, capable de rendre cohérent entre eux le projet ou les stratégies structurées de nombreux acteurs de la ville. C'est le sens de la mission Project Impost, dans le cadre duquel Perspective souhaite mettre en place une planification stratégique dynamique c'est-à-dire un processus d'actualisation continue de projets de vie en fonction de l'évolution de la situation socio-économique et des problématiques urbaines sur lesquelles le projet de vie et le proposer ses solutions. Cette mission se structure autour de trois axes de travail. Un suivi annuel et transversal d'évolution contextuelle de la région, le pilotage d'une concertation des acteurs régionaux chargés de la mise en œuvre des projets de vie, la réflexion pratique et prospective sur le thématique du projet de ville. Cette année, donc, la réflexion pratique et prospective s'est traduite par l'organisation d'une année thématique sur les questions de densité urbaine. L'objectif de cette réflexion 
Il est défini plus concrètement les conditions qui permettent de combiner dans cette densité urbaine et la qualité de vie dans les quartiers. Dans ce cadre-là que nous, nous retrouvons aujourd'hui avec ces deux bénéfices, je passe les paroles au curateur de la médiumatique densité, Jérôme Bratier. Jérôme, c'est à vous. Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Je suis Jérôme Baratier, le curateur qui accompagne Bruxelles dans cette saison consacrée à la densité de thème. Alors, pourquoi s'intéresser à la densité Eh bien, probablement parce qu'à Bruxelles comme ailleurs, c'est une controverse urbaine les plus vives. Souvent convoquée, souvent décriée, elle fait l'objet de débats enflammés ou parfois mal ancrés dans les termes qui sont utilisés. Alors, notre conviction, c'est que la densité doit faire l'objet d'une redéfinition, d'une revisite complète. Elle ne doit pas simplement être un rapport arithmétique de bâti sur une surface, mais elle doit aussi nous parler d'usage, elle doit nous parler de nature, elle doit nous parler d'interaction sociale. Cette redéfinition, nous vous invitons à y contribuer, à y participer en suivant les trois temps de la donnée. Le premier temps, nous y sommes, c'est une série de six webinaires dans lesquels des experts internationaux partagent avec vous leur point de vue sur la densité de thème. Le deuxième temps, c'est une masterclass qui réunira une quarantaine de personnes avant l'été, 40 personnes qui, très concrètement, envisageront des scénarios de densification, dans une acception extrêmement large, sur quatre territoires euh, de la région euh, de Bruxelles. Enfin, rendez-vous pour le troisième temps, à la rentrée de septembre, pour ensemble euh, capitaliser les enseignements des webinaires, de la masterclass, des cartes euh, similaires que nous aurons analysées à l'étranger. Le tour est venu pour essayer d'ensemble partager cette nouvelle définition d'une densité euh, de qualité. Alors ce soir, nous avons euh, l'immense plaisir d'accueillir euh, David Tim, qui est le, le directeur de la création de l'agence Google. Yann Gell a été le premier à Copenhague de positionner le piéton comme étant au cœur de la machinerie urbaine comme au cœur d'une nouvelle urbanité, et de positionner l'apaisement des espaces publics, la densification des interactions dans l'espace public, comme étant un moyen de faire émerger une densité de qualité. Depuis, David Sim, euh, sur les cinq continents, prolonge, amplifie cette démarche d'un urbanisme à, à échelle humaine. D'ailleurs, il le décrit euh, il développe très bien cette conception dans son euh, livre « Soft City », auquel il fera probablement référence dans son intervention. Mais avant de vous retrouver, David, j'invite chacun à sortir son téléphone pour qu'on puisse, par un petit sondage de trois minutes, pouvoir ensemble mieux cerner qui vous êtes, qui est l'auditoire et quelles sont aujourd'hui la vision que vous avez d'une densité quotidienne de qualité. Je vous remercie à tout de suite. Oui, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Animal. Donc, je vous invite à aller, vous voyez bien le code QR, ou bien sur le site menti.com et taper le code 4135233. So, I invite you to go to the website menti.com and type in uh, 4135233 in order to uh, answer a couple of uh, short questions to have a bit of an idea of who is taking part at this webinar. So please, to your phones. Uh, great, 27 likes, 30 likes, 34. It's all happening. OK, just a moment. So, s'il vous plaît, uh, veuillez bien entrer le code uh, 4135233. Uh, code dir in dri wave twe dri dri. Et nous pouvons passer à la prochaine. Voilà, petite question uh, toute simple. Un enkele frag.
la chaux de fond. Ah, bah dis donc. Intéressante, intéressante. Valentia, Oslo, Copenhague, Séville, Kiev. Eh bah, ben, we have quite an interesting crowd tonight from uh, beyond Europe. Okay, so that's already the, the average about 82. I think we can go to the next question. So here it's more to have an idea of uh, who you represent. So uh, unfortunately we can't see the questions anymore. Yeah, so it's like citizen association, university, private partner, regional administration or communal administration. That's in order to have an understanding of how Belgium works, you know. And really to understand who is taking part tonight. Thank you very much for participating. Okay, very interesting. We already have 72 answers, 73. So it's, yes, indeed, a fifth. Oh, it's nearly the same. A fifth of uh, administrative, a quarter, yeah, 20 private, 77 answers. Okay, I think we can go further on to the next question. Another classic question regarding density and urban mobility, of course, uh, in a working day, how often do you use uh, the following modes of transportation? Yeah, I was expecting uh, to have quite a few car owners. Most people are walking out of 65. That's pretty interesting, I guess. One of the questions would have been as well, uh, how many of you live in an urban environment, of course, but I guess once we get uh, to 80, we can go to the next question. Okay, so most of the people walk. In uh, in one word, one word to define density. Go. So this is going to be quite interesting. So interaction intensity. Yeah, I can, you can see the intensity interaction is taking quite an important spotlight out of 64 votes, mixity, proximity, yes, and the balance. Okay, once again, we have very interesting answers here. Okay, and I think we can go to the next question. Among these nine criteria for livable urban density, choose the three most important for you. So diversity of built form, diversity of outdoor spaces, flexibility, human scale, walkability, sense of control and identity, a pleasant microclimate, smaller carbon footprint, greater biodiversity. Once again, uh, diversity, walkability, biodiversity. It'll be very interesting to see how David uh, will explain to us. We can't read the, we can't read it anymore. But yeah, it was pretty much how we expected it.
Okay, great. Once again, uh, at least uh, more than 80 answers. Well, thank you so much for participating. That was very interesting indeed. And now uh, I will leave the floor to David. David, how do you do? Good evening. Bonsoir. Uh, it's very Good nice evening. to be here. The floor, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. I'm just going to see if I can now share my screen. Brussels Tuesday. Um, I'm also nervous about the technology. Um, we'll see. Oh, and hopefully, is that looking? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Hi, and I'm. And first of all, I guess I have to apologise. Although I'm representing Copenhagen this evening, I'm a Scotsman, so there's an accent talking a bit fast as well. Also, I've got a sore throat. I don't think it's COVID. Um, I've got a, about 190 slides, um, so we'll see how this goes. I will try to talk as clearly as possible, and, I, and I, we've got a lot of nice images, hopefully, which compensate for that. And I guess people are going to be dropping in all the time. So we're having this, this ding donging all the time as I go along. Anyway, soft, I call this soft density. Density is the theme. Um, I've just finished um, a, a book called Soft City, Building Density for Everyday Life. The original title was actually Density, Diversity and Proximity. But my Amer American publisher was a bit nervous about the word diversity. But as I will talk about in the next 45, 50 minutes, that diversity is going to be maybe absolutely vital. What is a soft city? Well, this, believe it or not, this is Sweden. This is Malmö. And you maybe wouldn't have imagined that on a spring evening that the Swedish people would dance tango in a public space outside some housing. But if you get the atmosphere right, if you get the, if you take care of things, people do surprising things. Even the Swedes start dancing in the city. And of course, Sweden is a very big landmass where people live in houses like these, because there's lots of space, you know, they drive their Volvos. So what is it that persuaded people that it was nicer to live in a more dense environment, um, joined up closer to other people than, than being in a, you know, on your own with your own garden and your own villa? This is Bo One in Malmö. You can see the diversity of color, the diversity of architecture and buildings. And if you see down on the ground, how close the buildings are to each other. You know, so very small spaces, kind of diverse architecture. It's kind of a little bit medieval scale, but the architecture is quite modern. And you see again, these quite human scale spaces. It's dense, but at a human scale. And what's important is of course, we have this, this scale of, of being a neighbor, um, the neighbor looking out the window and meeting people in public spaces and I think we're having some inter in, um, interference on the sound. I think somebody really needs to switch their their microphone off but I'll carry on. Um, so this scale of being a neighbor, your kids playing outside, people walking past um, and even the level of trust where you, your kids, you can let them outside, your kids can sell juice to strangers, cups of coffee. This tells us the level of trust. Um, eating out, maybe eating out is just taking some pizzas down to the waterfront. Um, or if you're a, a Viking style, it was never planned, but they started like, there's water there, why don't we swim in the water? And suddenly you have a situation where people are walking around the neighborhood in their dressing gown. How, how soft is that? But what's really soft is in this newly built housing area, when they go for a swim, they leave the door open because the cat has to go out, come out. And so suddenly you have this kind of behavior, which is kind of like a village, but in the middle of the city. And so I feel this idea that neighborhood is not just a place, it's a state of mind. And you think, okay, that's very cute. Swedes dancing tango and cats and doors. You know, there's a lot of serious shit we have to deal with. You know, I mean, in terms of climate, we're having these terrible floods in Scandinavia, as a result of climate change, we're seeing, uh, uh, an epidemic of obesity. Maybe even more ironic is the epidemic of loneliness in our cities. Um, we're seeing also an epidemic of inequality. Um, and of course, we're seeing congestion everywhere because of the way we've designed our cities, which keeps everything and everybody apart from each other. And if you see urbanization, 
you get these images of skyscrapers, of Shanghai, of Tokyo, and people feel very uncomfortable when we talk about densifying the city. And this is a picture from Helsinki. You say urbanization, densification, no thank you. And instead, maybe we need to find another scale, a human scale, a scale of relationships. And if you say this is the city, this is density, this is a density of relationship between people and place, a building which belongs to a street, to a square, a, uh, a relationship with a planet that you can open a window, you can open a door and connect with outside. And of course, a relationship between people and people. So these relationships can make places. And suddenly when we go back to Malmö, we can say this is not just a, a built area. This is a place where relationships happen. People mm -hmm. spending more time outdoors, different kinds of people using the space together. And then this way, maybe we can begin to get closer to some of these challenges in society by taking small steps closer to place, closer to the planet, closer to other people, small steps. And I guess this is the background. Um, Jerome already mentioned Jan Gale at the beginning. It says here, Jan Gale is the Robin Hood of architecture. Jan Gale's story is a love story of an architect who fell in love with an environmental psychologist. And this environmental psychologist, Ingrid, was very critical of the way that architect, architects design spaces. They designed these housing estates, very functional, but terrible for people. You know, and children, you know, you know, the scale of buildings, children couldn't get to play up the above four stories, they didn't have so many friends. So the scale of the place wasn't good for people. But importantly, you know, kids coming home from school couldn't even find their own homes because everything looked the same. Together, they established a field of research. Um, and for 50 years, it's been well known. Now, for 50 years, I would say I've also been working with the urban environment. This is me with my Lego. And, and I, I say this in a way because I feel everybody understands urbanism in the most simple way in terms of everybody's thought about the city around them. And, and my kind of my joke about this was always that um, my mother was always going crazy. I was building cities um, in the living room and she say, when will the city ever be finished? And I'd say, you know, mom, it's a city. It will never be finished. But my beginning as an architecture, what fascinated me was life. Like, you know, these children's books, seeing inside the houses, seeing the streets, all of the life that's going on. And for me, that was a big inspiration that when we think about soft city, we think about architecture, we think about urbanism, we think about the, the platform it represents for life. And I guess the softness is the softness of the human body. It's the softness of life. Um, another section here, this is Houseman's Paris. This was supposed to be a scary picture, you know, showing the, the layers of poverty in a building. But actually with today's eyes, when I look at this, I think, well, this is quite interesting because look, I mean, the poor people in the attic, these Bohemians living in the attic, um, those people that are in the attic in Houseman's Paris, they live 25 kilometers away, far from the center of the city. Because in, our, in, our, in the way we've redesigned our cities, we've socially segregated them because there's not a diversity of space. There's not a diversity of accommodation. And so all of those people who used to live, use the same staircase, live on the same street as the middle class and the rich people, they now live far away and don't have access to all of the assets of the city. So I guess I've been working all the time with the challenge of urbanization and diversity, but by, by density, sorry, by having this equation, density times diversity makes proximity. And I noticed when we did the word cloud of your comment that proximity was one of the, the number one words that you chose when you thought about about, 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 about the city and density. So we need to make cities which are more diverse. I think that requires a more greater diversity of spaces, different kinds of spaces, different types of accommodation that allows us to do more different things. So I'll start very, very quickly, five minutes of, of Jan Gale theory. Um, and of course, climates and cultures are different. I mean, I, I'm coming from this very north of Europe, Scandinavian perspective. But the way people use space is very, very similar because human beings are built in the same package. The way our senses work, we see what's at eye level, what we can reach. No matter where you are in the world, the market, the market stallholder will lift the products up to be closer to your face so you can smell the fruit, you can touch the apples. And it doesn't matter if you're in Switzerland or in Japan, the market is just the same because human beings, we have the same kind of bodies. When we walk along the street, 
everything that's eye level, the first three meters is what we experience. This is what kind of seduces us as we walk down a street. And all of this decoration and old shop front in Stockholm, this seduces us, invites us to look, maybe you'll find that bag, maybe you'll find those shoes. But, you know, in the same way, and this is Arne Jakobsen, the god of Scandinavian architecture. This is a, 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 a Carrara marble facade in the center of Copenhagen. And maybe it's the most expensive facade. It's the most architectural statement, but it's the most boring street. You know, and if you don't know, but if you know in a second that you'll have no reward for walking down the street, you won't find your shoes, you, your bag, you won't find that bag. You know, you won't meet the love of your life on the street. And so we have to think about this human scale of what the street gives us and attracts us to walk. You know, the supermarket opens seven days, but it's completely closed. How we can open up and appeal to our senses, you know, give us the sights, the smells, the sounds, the sound of the cappuccino machine, you know, the things to touch, to taste. This is softness. All of these invitations to connect, to connect with things, to taste, to people, seeing and sight, to where dancing lessons happen. This invitation is a window. It's something very, very simple, but these simple things make this dense city so much more attractive. Now, human beings are also very sociable. This is a picture from Switzerland. Now, Swiss people playing chess is maybe not the most exciting thing you can think of, but for these lonely men living in Bern, this chess game gives them a legitimate excuse to be in the public space. It gives them a legitimate excuse to start a conversation with a stranger. Oh, bad move. Yeah, terrible. He's rubbish. You know, these small things. And in this very lonely world, this simple little activity is very, very valuable. And maybe only two people playing chess, but 20 people can, can be taking part. And this is helping us deal with things like, you know, mental health, curing loneliness. And of course, I could talk for an hour about biophilia, the importance of connection with nature, water, the sounds of water, the sound of trees. And, and this brings us into this question of public health, because, you know, and, you know, this is my picture from the US. And of course, it's very funny to laugh at the things they do in America. They drive to the gym, they take the escalator to the fitness, and then inside they do all those exercises, you know. But of course, it's about we need help, we need exercise. And you can ask a surgeon or you can ask a nurse, what's the foundation of public health? And they'll say the same thing, fresh air, exercise, meet people. And this stuff, when we're talking about this dense city, this urban environment, we can invite more healthy outcomes. This is from the BBC. Walking would save thousands of lives in the UK. Here's another one. Walking cuts breast cancer risk. So we have to think about these environments we create, because if they become walking environments, we can actually start dealing with really big shit problems. You know, and of course, we can ask about the scale of the city we want to create. You know, little kids really love it if you appreciate the scale of being a kid. Um, you don't have to be French not to like La Défense. There's a scale that works for us. And that's why we love going on holiday to Venice, because a scale which we enjoys is the sensual scale, the scale of being a human being. And with that kind of theory about understanding how human beings enjoy space, get pleasure and delight out of space, here's some experience from Copenhagen. And Copenhagen has seen investment in public space. The idea that despite the climate, that in cold north of Europe, people can spend more time outside using public space. Uh, New Haven um, used to be a car park. Now people are using it as a public space. A thousand people rather than 60 cars in the space. Um, underneath the white umbrellas, there's the rich Belgian tourists drinking very expensive Chardonnay. Sitting along the waterfront, you've got the Danes who bought a six pack of beer at the, at the local at the local 7-Eleven. And of course, they're sharing the same space. This is also democracy. Different people sharing the same space, different incomes, different nationalities, different groups, sharing the public space, bringing diversity together in a small space. And we have a joke in Denmark that if you sleep late, you might miss the summer. You know, our weather's not great, but... You know, if we take care of people, they'll stay out longer. We've discovered that this this could this could be July in Copenhagen. You know, if you put a blanket, you have your beer, it's still nice to be outside. And if you can sit outside in a shitty day in July, 
You could sit outside in a shitty day in September or a shitty day in March. And now what's happened, that people now in Copenhagen, we sit outside as if we were in, in Rome or in Naples. We sit outside from March until December because we've learned to do it. Every year we've discovered we can start, the season starts early and can end later. And even in the snowstorm, people walk on that pedestrian street because it's nice to be outside. And what's shocking is, of course, that the people have their babies, the babies sleep in the pram outside. The mothers are inside drinking cappuccino, but the kids are outside. This is how, this is how we make Vikings, having the kids sleep outside. But what it tells us as well, that there's trust, that the mothers and our fathers, they feel they can trust, that it's safe to have their children outside. And of course, it's a very strong impression as you walk around the city, again, very soft, when people are, their kids are sleeping outside in the snow and there's trust that the children will not be kidnapped. Um, but of course, in the summer, we can extend the season too. We've discovered you can swim in the harbour. You can swim in the water. Um, we've learned to do that. The season, like the, like the cafe chairs, every year the season gets longer. They put a sauna there now, so you can swim in the winter as well. And the city's made of many things, sometimes very simple things. This is... Um, this is a, a pavement, a sidewalk, which continues across the side street. Very simple, but this is a time machine because this piece of concrete, which gives the dignity and the priority to the pedestrian, that means that your five minute walk becomes a three minute walk because you don't have to stop for the traffic. You can keep walking, you keep going, and you can walk more conveniently, more comfortably, you know, and if you've got your pram or your suitcase on wheels, it's more convenient. The cars stop for you. If you've got kids that are going to school, they can walk to school on their own. They can walk for 10 blocks without crossing the street. And this means it's safer. And suddenly this time machine maybe gives you an hour or an hour and a half to the mother and father every day because they can use the city in a different way. So it's a very simple thing, just extending the pavement across the side street. Um, another way of Copenhagen is kind of soft and works with the density, cycling. Now, cycling, take, bikes take up less space than people. Everybody can cycle. Grandmother can cycle, grandpa, the kid, even the scary guy with the sunglasses. Everybody can cycle. More people, less space. With this kind of cycling for dummies system that they have in Copenhagen, very clearly organized with the pavement, a curb, the track, a curb, the parked cars. And that means everybody knows where they're supposed to be. There's kind of order in the small space. It's separating the parking from the cycling is very important. It's hard to park your car. So we can make this kind of symbiotic relationship where it's easy to get out of your car without hitting somebody cycling. Cycling, you feel very safe. You've got the pavement on one hand, parked cars on the other. So this mass transit becomes very convenient and safe. And then these other things happen. You know, you can stop, you can stop. This is a picture from Paris, but this is the, the Danish moment. This is when, you know, you stop, you, 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 your cycle bus, you smell the bread. You know, you, it takes you 30 seconds. You stop, you park your bike, and within two minutes, you can buy some Danish pastry, you can buy some croissant, and then you can cycle on to work. This gives us a, a very interesting relationship between soft mobility, dense mobility, and the, the shopkeepers, much better. The cars can't do this. The cars are sealed in their box. They don't smell the coffee. They don't smell the, 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 the croissant. So this, this connection between movement, soft movement, slower but efficient movement connects us to business. And in this way, we have this kind of density or intensity of life on the street that the shopkeeper, the pedestrians, the cyclists, even the parked cars can be friends with each other if we organize the space in a convenient and practical way. And you can cycle in the summer and you can cycle in the winter. And I think 70% of Copenhageners cycle in the winter. Another great um, innovation, making it nice for families to live in the city was the greening of courtyards in Copenhagen. Traditionally, the courtyard was where the dumpster, where the rubbish, there were outside toilets, there were garages, there was parking. And there's been a program throughout the city to clean out the middle of the courtyard and make common gardens, like a, like a green space in the middle of the courtyard. And this shows it here. Not everybody takes part, but the city sponsored the project. 
they, 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 they create a collaboration and a structure for co collaboration between the different owners because these are old existing buildings. So there's social housing, there's cooperative housing, there's private housing all around together. The bright yellow on the diagram, this is the common space. It's not public, it's common for everybody living around the, you know, around the, around the courtyard. The pale yellow is shared space. It belongs individually to each building. And then the little gray you see is private. It's like the ground floor apartment has its own little garden. So we have these three different kinds of space, which allows much more to happen. And of course, the great thing about this courtyard is it's protected. It's visually secure, it's private. It's safe for your kids going out to play. You have this amazing big back garden, a much better garden than you'd have if you lived in the city, uh, if you lived in the suburbs, sorry. And of course, your children have got you know, other kids to play with. And you've got this situation where you've got lots of parents watching. So there's eyes on the courtyard. The kids can run down in 45 seconds to the courtyard. You can shout them in when dinner is ready. Um, maybe it takes a bit longer than 45 seconds to, to get them in again. But this thing about, you know, I mean, we'll talk later about the 15 minute city, but the components of the 15 minute city are 45 seconds, one minute, three minutes, five minutes, all of these little conveniences, which make it easy to be in the, to, or, you know, live in the city. And, and this green courtyard thing suddenly made it very attractive for families to live in the city. They also discovered there was a common identity by sharing the space. You could meet your neighbors in the space in the middle. It became a, a new zone to engage with your neighbors um, in this kind of pleasant space. This is, this is the, the, I showed you the picture of the yellow courtyard. This is the inside here with the big common space, the grass space where kids can play, have a picnic, have a concert, have, a, have some football. And of course, the other great thing but through this dense form, we get good microclimate. This protected outdoor space, the buildings make a comfortable wall. It protects us from the wind. It captures the sun. And especially in the north of Europe, this is great because we get um, cooler summers, a cooler place in the summer, a warmer place in the, in the winter, a few degrees difference. This is very important savings for air conditioning and heating. So there's an environmental aspect. And of course, by having the vegetation in the courtyard, we make it cooler with, uh, you know, this kind of uh, heat island effects affected. And if we've got transversal apartments, the difference in temperature between the apart you know, between the, the courtyard and the street means we get a natural flow of air. So we've got air conditioning for free. So simple form, you know, a clean, a clean space. You can hang your washing. You can sleep with an open window uh, in the space. And of course, it's quiet. We have this protected acoustic space and the value of silence, the, the value of quietness in the city, the, you know, obviously being hugely important for dealing with density. And these old blocks, you know, they allow many different kinds of buildings to coexist. So different kinds of housing, different tenures, different economies can exist side by side, which is important for the diversity. But also the block gives us a lot of ground floor. Now the ground floor can be active to the street, you know, with small shops or big shops or offices. Um, but we've you know, but we've discovered that actually we can put a lot of other things in the ground floor, not just shops, but we know we can put institutions, cultural facilities on the ground floor because we know Amazon's stealing a lot of the shops. But we've also discovered it's extremely convenient to live on the ground floor. It's like living your own little house, like you would in the suburbs, you've got your own front door. If you have your own little garden, one, two, three meters. This makes it very nice as a buffer if you've got kids for the pram, for the dog, for running inside and outside, for meeting the neighbors because you can stand outside and talk. If we take care of this ground floor, if we make a small space on the edge of the ground floor, we can increase the value of the apartments, the, the accommodation, the ground floor by 25%. So that we can have this piece of the, this generous ground floor, which we have more of, we build low dense. This can actually increase the value, and this is an important story to tell to your developers who are making the project. But of course, it's important that when you step outside the building, that there's something there. And of course, this is the classic modern situation where you have nothing. There's no control of what's outside. 
This is also Copenhagen. And you've got this big surface of grass, which is just a big dog toilet. But if we take care of the edge by doing this little piece, we make a little house in the city by giving a little piece of ground to, a, to, the, to the ground floor apartment. This creates huge value for living in the dense environment. And in exactly the same way, we can do the same with the with the top floor because every top floor is a potential penthouse with all of the possible things you can do there. And if we think about layering our building, so the ground floor speaks to the street, then we have the middle, and then we make the most of the top floor, we can really make the most of this density we're creating. And we can put surprising things, gardens, apartments, penthouses up there on the roof. And now when we build new areas in Copenhagen and new areas in Scandinavian countries, we use this courtyard form because this is the perfect way to create density at a human scale, to, to give safe place for kids to play, um, to give quality of life every day. So this idea of density and being together as human beings, there are great forms that work for that. And then a final thing from lesson from Copenhagen is this thing about climate, and we've mentioned Greta already, about climate change and the challenge the cities have. And of course, we're having these floods now that we never had before. And cities are very infrastructure heavy. We have worse flooding in cities because we've got so many hard surfaces. And the hard surfaces mean the rain kind of you know, penetrate the ground and we get floods, floods very quickly. Now, Copenhagen had a big challenge. Should they invest in big pipes under the ground that five, six days a year would take away the flood? Nobody would see it. It would be billions and billions of kroner. Instead, they invested on soft public space. They took away car parks, they took away asphalt, and they designed public space which could be floodable. 360 days a year, it's park space, it's green space, but a few days a year, it can flood. It can flood and give us a, a poetic reminder of what climate change is. But what it does, of course, is it creates a much greener city. It makes living in the city more pleasant. This is an existing area which has been climate adapted with these soft surfaces, which, of course, apart from absorbing the flood water, they also make the city quieter. They absorb noise. They absorb the nanoparticles from fuel. And of course, they cool down the city for heat island effect. And this is just very simple vegetation. So very simple things, you know. And I guess these are these small steps to soften the city. The dense city becomes soft. Small steps, easy things. Not con This is not smart city. This is not technology. Simple things that can make city, you know, more attractive. And what makes Copenhagen wonderful? It's simple, thoughtful details that make everything work so well. So this was the idea of soft city that I had. Can I capture all of those things? And let's present density, every life in a way which maybe makes sense and maybe can be more attractive than the less dense city. Um, and this learning from this pattern of building, this traditional way of building, and this is a picture of the same density. And I'm sure you've seen this in other books, that this is exactly the same density, but in different different forms. And I, I was somehow not really sus a bit suspicious. You know, could this really be the same? So because I'm a Lego kid, I showed you the Lego at the beginning. I made my own test with Lego. And here we have small blocks, urban blocks, 50, 60 meters, four stories, four bricks, four stories high. If we make a big block rather than a small block, the bricks don't fit in. So we have to go higher. So suddenly, rather than four stories, we have six stories. And you get further from the ground, further from the connection with human, other human beings. Uh, maybe you need much more lines on the elevator and all those things. If you build slab blocks, you have to go up to 12, 13 stories. And of course, you're becoming very, uh, there's more green space maybe, but it's very far away and maybe not so relevant when you're living so far from it. And of course, we can build towers in different shapes and maybe there's more technically more green space, but it's not as accessible. It's not as useful in this windswept open no man's land. And so I think somehow this one is the most interesting because it gives us the most qualities. And I think it's important in all of our conversations that high density doesn't have to mean high rise. And so we have a choice. We have a choice which kind of density we choose. 
And I think maybe this one, it, and maybe it can look, you know, in different ways. You know, it doesn't have to be flat. You know, we can make it look many different forms, but we can create a very exciting urban form, which has got variety, but also has the human scale. And I guess what I've taken is some themes, which I think are important for this density. And one is the opportunity to live locally. And it's this idea of density times diversity gives us proximity because things are close to us. And this idea that we're looking for a form which is in the middle, this missing middle, a human scale form, which is comfortable and nice with a nice microclimate, <clears throat> but at a scale that we're comfortable with. And what we're seeing around Europe, <clears throat> around the world, we're seeing a new architecture coming of this dense, but human scale urban form and looking differently in different places, but definitely it's possible to find this kind of scale to give density in a, in, a, in a way which gives us these qualities. And the other thing is about getting around in this compact city that we can get around. Um, like I said, the 15 minute city, it's made up of small components of 45 seconds to going up the stair, one minute to cross the road, two minutes. And we put all of these little things together, you know, of, of the connection. So that the mobility in the city, of course, is about bike lanes and pedestrian crossings and bus stops, but it's also about how your apartment connects to the street, how the ground floor connects to the street and so on. And I guess what's important too is in terms of social mobility is about accessing the assets, accessing all of the services, the culture, the opportunities, the learning that the city represents. So we can make those things accessible. Unlike in Copenhagen, the, the sidewalk, the pavement that continues, or the little, we have a little strip down the middle of the street, which means that you can cross the, sto the street spontaneously. You don't have to wait or walk all the way around to the pedestrian crossing. You can cross where you are. You can spontaneously cross. Um, having this friend relationship between different modes of transport. Um, but even the fact the way that while you're waiting for the bus or the tram, you can be doing useful things that every second of your life has value in this dense environment. You know, you really can choose, you know, and you, and you know, here, this is from Hamburg. You know, you can be drinking your coffee. You've been drinking your beer right up to this two seconds before the bus comes. And this is really what the 15 or one minute city is about. And I guess it's important because there's so much discussion about TOD, transit oriented development. You know, we should, every time we have a bus stop or a metro station that we should build a tower and you know this um, and you should be somehow connected. All that this does is it connects you to somewhere else. This does not connect you where you are. So what we need instead is neighborhood oriented transit that we really think about designing the mobility to support the neighborhood and where the journey it starts in your apartment in the staircase walking along the street maybe you get off the tram one stop early to go to the shop and you walk a bit further you go a little bit further traveling at eye level seeing what's going on you know seeing there's a sale on in your favorite store you know smelling the crossings when you're on your bike so we have to think in this different way and this is just the street in Copenhagen, mixing all those things together. And finally, there's this idea of planet, ecology, living with nature, living, living with the weather, and all the small things we can do that in a dense environment can bring us closer to the forces of nature. We can build our own weather. Like I said, with the courtyard, with the shape of the roof, we can deflect the wind, we can capture the sun. We can make better weather for ourselves. This is an example here, this is in Malmö. It's a wall. How simple is this? It's a stone wall which creates a microclimate. And this microclimate allows you to sit outside in January and sunbathe. Because, you know, and although it's cold when the wind's blowing, if you're protected from the, the wind, you can sit outside. And this is in, 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 in the medieval town of Lund in Sweden, where I live. They've recognized this. They've discovered that in the medieval square, because the microclimate is so nice, you can sunbathe, but not only in the summer, even in the winter when there's snow, the microclimate is so nice, it's possible to be outside. And so this is just like about making our own weather and little details like protecting us from the rain, you know, having a balcony, which allows us to spend more time. These are 
new balconies added to old buildings in Copenhagen. Um, or this one is from Lyon in France, having this you know, flexible zone with the louvers and the kind of the glass. So you can extend the season of living inside and outside, connecting you to living with the weather, making the dense environment more attractive. And all of these little details about how we design can actually not only give us better experiences, we can save energy through ventilation, uh, passive heat gain. Um, and of course, we can get by small things like arcades, little edge gardens, balconies, terraces, roof terraces, we can be connected with nature. And maybe we don't need a garden. Maybe we just need that space. One second in the, in the, in the time, the 15 minutes a day, it takes me two seconds to step outside to my balcony and to be in another space, have another experience. And I guess there's this thing about what density means. And we can like imagine a scale where we can be dense, but give people something that feels like a village. It feels like home. And I guess this is the density I'm trying to achieve in this soft city. And this is kind of what um, we've is achieved in places like Malmo, which makes people um, want to want to even spend time or time in the public space and maybe even even dance. So that was actually where I stop here. This is Kitos. This is Finnish. Um, merci bien for now. I have actually some more things I could show you, but I think maybe we'll take a little break and we'll see if there are any questions. Um, I also have some thoughts about how to make the the suburbs more dense, but we can maybe stop for a moment and have some questions. So I will. Um, well, thank you so much, David. Uh, that was really uh, brilliant and uh, passionate. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm having tr trouble oh. stopping the sharing. Yeah, can you stop my share for me? So I can do this. No, you have to do that. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So it went very fast, I'm afraid. So I think maybe a tsunami of, of ideas, <laughs> but I, I hope you managed to, to, to get some of it. And maybe provoke some some thoughts. Absolutely. Non, je peut-être. Euh, merci beaucoup, David. Peut-être que Nicolas pourra pourra traduire pour pour les auditeurs euh, très très simplement euh, la définition que vous nous proposez de la densité, c'est finalement celle du rapprochement. C'est celle de la relation. Alors, vous savez, en France, on a, il y a un acteur très connu qui est mort la semaine dernière, qui s'appelait Jean-Paul Bacry, et qui avait fait un, un film qui s'appelait « Le goût des autres ». Donc, la soft city, c'est le goût euh, euh, des autres. Et vous nous avez dit, finalement, dans le monde entier, on utilise l'espace public de la même manière. Je voudrais revenir là-dessus. Est-ce que c'est vraiment vrai Est-ce qu'il y a une variable culturelle à la manière dont l'espace public peut créer des relations euh, sociales. Bonne chance, Nicolas. <laughs> Just uh, so Jérôme asked a very interesting question regarding the relationship to space, uh, quoting uh, a movie by the late actor Jean-Paul Bacry. And uh, it's really about, do we use the city in the same way in, in every cultural setting? Um, could sum up. Okay, it's a, um, a very good question. And I, I think because, I mean, I think what's fast. I mean, when Jan Gale started in the 1970s talking about this public life, it was a joke. It really was a joke. Like, oh, you know, you think the Danes are going to behave like Italians, you know? And there were jokes in the national newspaper about Jan Gale, like, oh yeah, and the Copenhagers, Copenhageners are going to drink coffee on the street. It was just such a joke because it would never happen. And I think coming back to this idea of the city never being finished, culture is constantly evolving. And it's about, um, it's, it's about, I'm sorry, oh, um, it's about um, those opportunities to do things, that, you know, if we have an opportunity to sit down. What happened in Copenhagen was they took away the cars. The shopkeepers didn't want this to happen. The shopkeepers were terrified they would go bankrupt if the cars could not stop outside their store. And everybody said, like, what do you know, pedestrian street in Denmark? This is not our culture. We're Lutherans, you know. Or not Latinos, you know, um, and so there was just this. But what we discover is when you give this opportunity, people take take it. If you give somebody the opportunity, opportunity to sit down, they sit down. If you give the opportunity for somebody to sit in the sunshine, they, they, they enjoy the sunshine. 
And it's about giving these invitations. And I think in every project we make, we try to say it's an invitation. We cannot force you. And I think maybe the mistake of some of the architecture, the very well meant architecture of the 60s and 70s was kind of forcing people to be sociable. We cannot force you to be sociable. We can invite you. We can give you this opportunity. And I think you have to give it on the and as a balance because um, there was a very strong movement in Denmark in the 1970s against public housing, the big projects. I showed the concrete bars um, and it was called um, low dense. And the idea was we need to give people more the, 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 the feeling of being an individual. But it was a balance. It was being an a sociable individual. So you had the little house with the little door and a tiny garden. And so you had the identity of the individual, but there was also a public space component to create community. And you need both this kind of yin yang. You need um, the, the privacy and the security to feel comfortable with yourself. Then you have the confidence to be sociable. Mm -hmm. But if people feel too exposed, you know, they shut the door and they close in. And so I think it's a constant balance of creating um, um, the, the, the security, the com personal comfort to make people more sociable. So around the world, I would say everywhere we go, say, oh, Copenhagen is very nice, but you know, in the in Brussels, we're different. You know, you know, no, no, in Zurich, we're different. You know, in Tokyo, we're different. But actually, if you look at human behavior, like, like if you go to the marketplace or if you go to a beer hall or something, you see people behave in the same way. And of course, I mean, it's a little bit different. I mean, of course, maybe the Italians are a bit closer and the Japanese are you know, a little bit you know, more shy. But generally, we see very similar behavior. And so I think it's about creating nice opportunities and cultures start to change. And, and for me, it's incredible. In my lifetime, we've seen a completely different way of behaving in the north of Europe. We've learned that although we have terrible weather, you know, we don't have the we don't have the food culture. We don't have the nice wine. We don't, you know, you know, in Denmark, we've got two beers. You know, in Belgium, you've got, you know, you've got <laughs> 5,000 beers. But, you know, we're, we're not, we don't have the sophisticated background. But we've learned we can, even with our Carlsberg, we can sit outside. And you know, and 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 adapt, and it's constantly evolving. It's not static, and for me, that's the really interesting part. It's constantly evolving and constantly changing. I don't know if that was a good answer. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. I have a couple of questions here that are pretty much uh, the, not the same, but they, they are in close relationship. So basically, it's really regarding. How, how, how can you transform a low density housing and uh, what about semi public space? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, a okay. Um, I could, oh, I could show you um, a couple, I can show you a couple of examples if that's okay. I go back and, and share the screen again. Um, and, um, and actually, I started with actually a picture uh, from Belgium because one of my great heroes was Lucien Kroll. And he was the first one to kind of explore this idea of softening the density and the diverse form and something more human and soft. So that was a huge inspiration, you know, I mean, around the world of, of how to you know, reimagine density. And I think just an example of a densification, because often, um, you know, this kind of suburban housing is not so dense as you think. Uh, although the, 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 the buildings are 10 stories tall, there's so much empty space in between that maybe it doesn't, it's not so dense. This is a social housing area, Rosengård in Malmö in Sweden. And it's actually not that dense. And one of the examples of, of one of the projects is we have this kind of idea to build extensions to the buildings. And you can see here the green roof. And on the ground floor, they've made a shopping street because they've created a street in this abstract landscape. And they've brought in this new, smaller, more human scale. And we have this kind of like reducing the shape is improving the microclimate as well. So it's bringing businesses, working spaces to the otherwise very big spaces. And, and of course, you know, maybe with um, a lot of immigrant areas, social housing, there are problems of unemployment. So creating workspace, creating places to be. So a very simple, quite cheap extension reduces the scale, 
densifies, but also diversifies. And also because it's creating this diversity, it gives you more reason to stay in the place. So this is kind of one I quite like. And then on a bigger scale, if you talk about densification, a very interesting one about diverse, d densifying suburbs is from Melbourne. Now, Melbourne's a great city in Australia. It's one of the most livable cities in the world. Um, they decided for densification, what was their role model? And they chose Barcelona because Barcelona has got no towers. It's one of the densest cities in the world with no towers, very high quality public space. And they started talking about how you define density and talking about people, people per, per hectare and not meters. So really rethinking and showing that even with four or five stories, you can actually have very, very high densities. And so the idea was for 3% of the metropolitan area of, uh, of uh, Melbourne, they could densify along the urban corridors, the tram corridors. So those places where there were trams, they would only densify in these areas. So everywhere else they would save. And the idea was that they could densify at a human scale along these corridors, making them more, I mean, you know, and the ideas that could be done, I will explain in a moment. This was the concept, this is the visualization, just to densify along these corridors up to four, five, six stories. This was the idea. But to make it doable, because you know planning permission is a nightmare. So they created a system on one piece of A4 paper, all of the rules. So one piece of paper, and if you fulfill all these rules, you get your planning permission tomorrow. You can build tomorrow. So rather than waiting five years to get the permission to build the tower, you can build, you know, you can only build on one of the tram streets or the bus streets. You cannot touch public buildings or heritage buildings. Um, there's a height limit that the building cannot be higher than the width of the street. And the buildings must step down at the back so they don't shadow the neighbours, which are not densified. Um, they have to take care of their own parking from behind. So no parking access from the street. Um, there should be no setback. So you respect the street. Um, there should be an active ground floor with a high ceiling. Um, there should be windows, of course, to the street. Um, and then there's freedom zones to do what you want. And then there should be the public space where the residents can access the public space. Nine simple rules on a piece of paper and you get your planning permission tomorrow. So it's not just a, 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 a code for building, it's a process for building faster. And so this is the traditional street in Melbourne. You know, two story, one story, maybe a church and the tram or the bus is running. The shops are not doing so well. There are not enough customers for the shops to survive. There are not enough um, passengers to use the tram. But if we start densifying building by building so that the guy who owns one building, he can do the project himself. So we can have a small scale densification and one by one, we can start to densify at this four or five, six stories, small scale. When this happens, you know, the, the other businesses start doing better. We can upgrade the street. You see there are now streets, there are bike lanes. We can upgrade the public realm and then we can densify. And this is the model we made very simple rules, a way to densify over time where the local people decide the pace. And these, this is now the reality. These are the new buildings that have come. Contemporary architecture along those streets. Um, a very, you know, kind of a new way of living in the, you know, in the, in the urban realm. But, you know, and this was just a model for delivering that change because it's not just about having a, a code for densifying. It's also about finding a delivery mechanism which allows it to happen at a scale which is comfortable for the people. And you can see here this change. When you go from one story to five story, this is possible. From one story to 20 stories is not possible. And so this is just like a, a way of doing it. And I found this quite, quite fascinating that there was a model for delivering this kind of low key density um, along certain routes with public transport in the suburbs. So I thought there's maybe something we could learn from this. And again, I stopped sharing. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Plenty of questions coming, uh, coming our way. Uh, regarding 
I, I don't think you really managed to, to answer uh, a question uh, uh, regarding uh, the importance of a semi-public space. Yes. Well I, well, I think the idea that there are these grades, there are these different definite, I mean, we have public space and then there is a private space. But the idea that these there are these in-between zones, um, and I think Jan Gilles used a lot of the term, there's semi-public, semi-private. Um, and I mean, you could describe it in another way. There is... Um, there are private spaces which are accessible. You know, um, there are spaces you can see, but you cannot go into. So we have these kind of zones. And I think what's important is all of these different, we have common space. Now, I showed the courtyard in Copenhagen and that has got a layer. We've got private space or we call it semi-private because it's very visible. This little tiny garden in front of the apartment. Then we've got a shared space, which the 10 apartments in the building, they share a, a little yard where you can put your bike and you can leave your tools and the kids can leave their toys. Then we have the common space or semi-public. It's not public because it's shared. It's actually a kind of private, um, but it's common to the neighbors. And I think what's important is these differentiations, the subtle nuance, the nuance is what makes the, the soft city function. Like I can choose and, and, I, and because I control and it's kind of like it's kind of like layers of clothing. You know, I, I can choose if I want to unbutton my top button, I can choose to do that, you know, or if I want to put on a sweater, I can choose that and I control my relationship with outside. And so those intermediate kind of spaces can allow for a greater range of behaviors. So I can drink my coffee, take my computer to my front garden. But maybe I'm not comfortable taking my coffee cup onto the public sidewalk. But if I sit in my with my coffee cup um, next to the sidewalk, I can speak to strangers. I can engage. I'm comfortable. They are comfortable. It's a bit like, you know, in America, they have this front porch. You know, it's private, but it's semi-private because you, you're, you're addressing the street. You're conversing with the street. So it's those it's these spaces of invitation again these spaces of opportunity, which allow the two worlds to meet. And it's kind of a, a kind of, I suppose I can only think of it as a kind of a nuance of space, if that makes sense. Okay. And uh, further on on the concept of uh, densifying uh, co transport corridors, is it clever to densify cycling or walking corridors too? Well, of course, I mean, I think, I mean, for example, um, I mean, it's always difficult because Putting cycle lanes on the busy streets is a bit, you know, always a bit controversial. Um, I know generally they put the, put the bikes where nobody will mind you know, on the side street or something. It's been very strong in Copenhagen to put the bikes on the main street. Um, and that's because they are, they, they, they engage a lot with the multiple uses, like they stop at the shops. We've discovered the cyclists spend more than the, than the cars. Um, but it's kind of... Um, when you have a high density of movement, so if the corridor is a, cor is a, is a, is a busy walking corridor, it's a busy uh, cycling corridor, it's a busy public transport corridor, all of those things should, could be prioritized. If it's only walking, it's a question of the, the numbers, the, the footfall, because if it's not a busy route, then it's very strange why you would densify it. But of course, there's, I mean, What's very interesting, I mean, for me, the best example of density is Venice. Mm -hmm. you know, Venice is unbelievably dense you know, because it's a city of walking. So Venice proves that you can actually densify the walking city if you have a density of activity and people. Um, I was, in, in, I was in, de in Venice this summer, which was wonderful because there were almost no tourists. So it was a more authentic experience in terms of the, the numbers. Um, and I, so there's, there, there's a scale of walking where, yes, you could maybe densify if there are enough numbers of people walking. OK, thank you. Uh, questions again regarding the, the inner courtyards. And uh, you showed us a couple of examples already for Copenhagen, but do you have any best practice examples that collectivize inner courts in the existing urban network without rebuilding? Um, Outside of um, outside of Copenhagen, you mean? For example, well, I mean, I mean, I mean the, the Copenhagen story. I mean, it, it was uh, it was very complex because we've got many many different ownerships, and yeah. and I think 
you, sometimes you have to ask the the question. I, I, I mean, and again, this is why I, I gave the Melbourne story. It's not just like, oh, I have this nice idea. You know, we want to make it, you know, we want to make it green. We want to densify. It's also about finding a mechanism. And I think it's a big problem that urbanists and architects and designers, we don't discuss it at school, the mechanisms, the processes. We're very concerned with the product, with the, the, the hardware. And I think maybe this is also the software, the, the software of, of, the, of the city. Um, it's like how to make things work. So in Copenhagen, the, the, the city, because the city has this kind of role as controlling planning, they were able to make a, a platform to start doing this screening project. And so I think it's important to use the city in the instruments the city has to make available funds, to make available expertise, to inform, to educate, to explain, to make demonstration projects, because people couldn't imagine this. Like, how can you imagine this garden courtyard? You know, I, and it's very convenient. Now I'm parking my car there. I don't understand. You're making it more difficult for me. And so it's like finding ways to educate everybody, making demonstrate projects, taking people to visit those projects. Like, oh, this is nice. Then for the private owners will understand, OK, this will increase the value of my apartment. This is interesting. You know, I mean, and it's kind of working on many different levels. And so I think it's it's really it's not just about finding examples of of physically doing the project. It's finding examples of the mechanisms and the processes to make it happen. And I think this is all around, around the world now we're learning this. And now um, even, you know, I mean, in, in most recently I've been working in Australia, they've been really much more active with community engagement and you know, information, active process and taking people on the journey. So I think it's about processes are just as relevant uh, as best practice, best practice process. Okay, and regarding uh, aspects that are that should be about the same around the world, you describe the suburbs as a place for divorce. <laughs> okay, is, is the low that is low density impacting uh, upon the relationship between people? Is it the same everywhere? Well, I mean, I, but I think also it's very interesting. I mean, we, we have a, a discourse amongst you know, architects and designers, but I think it's very nice to talk about people. You know, very often the way that works for the family is that um, you know you you go to the city, you come from some horrible suburban place or some village and then you come to the city to study and it's wonderful like urban you many your premiere of urban life is as a student and you love being in the city and then you meet your boyfriend your girlfriend in the city and you want to stay there and so you live together in some small apartment and then maybe you have a kid and even with a small baby you can survive in the urban environment you can still go and have coffee and wine and then maybe when the kid is five or six year old oh the kid needs grass and so we, we, we you know we, so so we have to move to the suburbs because the kid needs to kick a football and so we move we, we take this big loan we borrow a lot of money and we buy this house in this very isolated place and we have to drive two hours every day and we're working really hard to you know just to get the money and when you get home you're really tired and then you cannot go for a glass of wine you cannot go to a movie um you know it, you're a little bit further because the relationship with the neighbors is often a little bit more formal in this very neat suburb. So it's kind of like a little bit less flexible. And so you're stuck at home, you know, opening a bottle of wine, arguing with your wife about money. Um, maybe you have a, a, an affair with the neighbor because, you know, the, you know, you can't go somewhere else. But there's something about the, the, the monotony of the suburb that very often it, it, it deprives us of living a full life. And it's in the, you know, in, the, in the same way, you know, it's like it's very difficult. Like the other solution is your mother-in-law moves in and she looks after the kids. That's fantastic because she does all these nice things with the kids. She bakes and plays games with them. She saves the family. She destroys your marriage. You know, and it's um, if you're in an urban environment where, you, where, where the mother-in-law can come on the bus or on the tram, she doesn't need to sleep over, you know, or she can rent a little apartment down the street. You know, that's much more tolerant. So I guess... One of my other ideas about this uh, softness, it's about tolerance. It's about, you know, we have different needs at different times. You know, some things are irrelevant and suddenly they become important. And if we can kind of take care of people throughout their lives. And what I learned, somebody said to me, if you want to see a good city, you should look for eight and nine year old children in the city. Because 
This means the family has been able to survive. When the kid was five and six, they didn't move to the suburbs. It was possible for them to stay in the city. So look for the eight-year-olds, the nine-year-olds. And the ir irony is you move to the suburbs because the five-year-old needs grass. You know, and maybe, you know, and after five years, by the time they're 12, they want to, the kid wants to be in the city because they're, you know, they're gaming, they're in the orchestra, they're in the hockey team, you know, the, all of the attractive things, you know, are back in the city again, yeah. and you're driving home from work only to drive your kid back into the city again in the evening. And so it's about if we can create a city which works for all ages, and if we can take care of this eight-year-old, eight to 12-year-old children, families can live in the city longer. And I guess, I mean, this everyday life, and maybe this is very banal, you know, and um, a lot of the things I'm talking about are very boring. And actually, just, I got just to Just to stop you there, I mean, it's, I just have to remind everybody that, that we still have about 10 to 12 minutes left. And uh, Jerome would like to ask you a question uh, okay. more regarding the tools. I'm okay. really sorry to stop you in your... No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I, I can keep talking, you know. I know. Merci, merci beaucoup, uh, David. Um, je, je reprends uh, la question de Laura, uh, qui, qui était dans le, dans le chat. Um, uh, votre urbanisme de l'invitation, est-ce qu'il a les documents d'urbanisme adaptés En gros, quels sont les outils Est-ce que c'est la planification qui permet de, de faire cette soft city Est-ce que c'est un dialogue avec les opérateurs privés Quelle est la boîte à outils, finalement, de cette, cette, cette densité euh, des relations So, it was the toolbox to set up such a density. OK, um, it was, um, yes, I mean, so there's a... There's an idea. I mean, first of all, there's some idea about the, the hardware, the physical form. I'm, I'm trying to communicate it in a simple way. Um, and so, for example, for me, this piece of paper from Melbourne, one piece of paper with simple drawings, almost no text. This is an example of a simple tool which makes it easy. And I think we also have to like understand that we have these, you know, um, developers, the operator, the, you know, the, the developers who are making of making projects and even sometimes it's private developers who deliver the social housing sometimes. And how can we make it logical and um, relevant for them? And I think in a way, I feel there are some universal answers that what's good for human beings that were soft, curious, social animals, a little bit shy, but you know, a little bit interested, you know. So I'd say whether we're Japanese or Belgian or Danish, but, um, so human beings are kind of the same, whether they've got money or not. So um, in a way, I would say, if I want to say in the nice city, if I was talking about the socialist mayor or to the conservative mayor, the, the city I'm describing would look the same. But the way I would tell the story would be very different. And there's something I think maybe a big part of what we have to do is, is telling the story. And again, is this yin yang of public and private. It's also about um, the need to invest in what's not um, what's not private. Um, and that's a very difficult thing, you know, in, you know sometimes in mentality. Mm -hmm. Some some cultures or some countries have it stronger in the Scandinavian countries. In the Netherlands, this is much stronger that this is policy to be more sociable and you accept it. Maybe in France and Belgium it's a little bit more conservative. But um, I think Finding a narrative which makes sense. Um, the one which always works with the private side is location, location, location. And when we talk about location, we're not talking about the property. What gives the true value to the property is the location. Like the immediate neighbor, the next door neighbor. I mean, my, my father said to me, like when I bought my first house, he said, buy the worst house on the best street. You know, because it's, you buy you buy the location, you don't buy the building, and this makes sense for the developer. Like, okay, because you can do the best project, but unless the surrounding is good, the value will not be great. So it's understanding that the value of investing in the street, the street tree, I mean, even things like the little shop, and now, you know, the the the, the bench 
all of those things lift the value, the life of the street, the feeling of security and safety. This adds value. So it's how we tell the story about the added value of investing in what's not private, but it makes the private thing worth more. And, and, you know, and, and this is, I think, the constant discussion. Um, also, it's important even for like the, the, the social housing, which has to be as cheap as possible. And they want to spend all the money on the apartment rather than spending a little bit of money on what's outside. Um, otherwise, I think in the story about making the city, we're trying to bring in more, more actors. So it's not just the developer. So I talked about health, for example, public health and the, the importance of public health. We've had a situation now where I think it was started in Scotland. The chief medical officer for Scotland, he's kind of like the minister of health kind of something. He made the decision to take money from the health budget, the medical budget, to spend on public space. And he said, this is preventative medicine because we have obesity, we have heart disease. If people are walking more, spending more time outdoors, this is a, will give us a health benefit. So we need to have a more holistic way to finance the city, that the city is not only paid for by the developer. We need to have more actors coming in to pay for this healthy city. Um, and if we want to talk about, you know, the, the, the learning city, the educational city, the, the entrepreneurial city, we have to bring in more actors to help contribute to do these, I mean, these extra things. Of course, many of the things I've been proposing are quite simple. They're quite cheap, but generally there's no money for those things. There's no money for one bench. You know, there's no money for one tree. And so we need to find a, 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 a mechanism to bring in um, a broader kind of funding and a broader understanding that urbanism is not a question just for architects. Urban is a, is a question for doctors and health, health experts, you know. Um, and, 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 and this way, I, I think maybe we have to ultimately make the city more relevant for politicians. And for me, the, the most exciting change we've seen, because I mean, everybody hates their government, you know, every, everybody's complaining, you know. Um, but the really dynamic politics we're seeing now is not the prime minister, it's not the president, it's the mayors yeah. around the world. We're seeing a renaissance in the mayor. The mayor is the one who can do something because he's making a local decision. He's doing something quite fast. People see the benefit. Oh, I understand why he's doing that. And he's very close to the citizens. So I think the, the political hope is the mayor. And maybe, you know, we start seeing more like the, the city state coming back where actually the mayor is the really interesting politician. Um, you know, and we've seen in the United States for the pandemic, it was the mayors who took on the role to be the ones taking care of the safety of people. So I think this could be an opening as well for the tools is to, to broaden the discussion, to make the, 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 the subject accessible with simple drawings, a simple narrative, but make it more inclusive and more relevant for more people. Okay, great. That was, that thank, was a reasonable thank, answer. Thank you so much, David. Just, we'll have to wrap it up really soon. Just a last question and then I'll have to to talk about our next guest for the, the next month. But really, uh, a last quick question, if you could give us a quick answer. So <laughs> how far can we possibly densify? Is there too much density? Yes, I mean, no, I mean, okay, that, okay, so it's like, um, you know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, what's the meaning of life? Yeah. Um, the answer is 1.75. Okay, that's what we wanted to hear. <laughs> no, 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 you know, there's this, this plot ratio thing. Generally, up to this 1.75 FAR, you can create a reasonable environment. Above 1.8, it's really hard. That's the short answer. Okay, so we need to, we need to do a t-shirt. We need to do a t-shirt with that. Hashtag 1.8. Okay. Anyway. Uh, Thank you very the, much for from listening. All, Merci from, à tous. From all of us, I wanted to thank you very much to participate at this uh, fascinating and super interesting uh, presentation and webinar. Et à tout le monde, à tous nos participants, je voudrais vous remercier d'avoir été patient avec nous et d'avoir été là. Vous êtes resté quand même une moyenne de 90 participants. On était 127 jusqu'à un moment. Thank you and all of all for this avant. Et je voulais aussi, so I would like, I'll continue in English anyway, as a, this is the way we started. So next week, next month, 
uh, the 23rd of February at five o'clock, we'll have uh, we'll have the chance to have the, the searcher researcher Meta Berghauser Pont. Once again, someone from Sweden. Well, because David is in Lund, even though you work in Copenhagen, and uh, she will uh, she's a researcher at the University of Chalmers in Gothenburg in Sweden, and she really is a specialist in the space syntax, which is quite a known known book. She came out with, and uh, she will really interrogate the the link between urban form and density. So uh, once again, thank you all. Merci Jérôme de votre participation à nouveau. Merci Julia, David. Taxo me quer, hore bro, hore go kvel. Et merci à vous tous. Et uh, n'oubliez pas, all this uh, webinar will be online soon, so we'll be able to send you the link so you can watch it, rewatch it with your families and everybody, and eat popcorns in front of it because it's so fascinating. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.